Hello, welcome to Values, Virtues, Ethics and Morality. I am Magla Pillay and today I have here in the studio with me Sister Denise who has been practicing Raj Yoga meditation and is a teacher of such with the Brahma Kumaris World Spiritual University for several decades. Sister Denise is a mine of spiritual information, wisdom, and carries with her a wealth of spiritual experience. So today we are going to look at the subject of purity being a moral compass. The purpose of this show, as you will see from all the other episodes, is to ask you, the listener, to look at your own conscience, look at your own sets of values and standards and ask yourself the very simple question, is this working for you? Is who you are harming you or doing you good? Is it harming the people around you? Is it harming the environment, etc.? And Sister Denise has taken us through various subjects on this um, fascinating topic. And today, uh, let's see what she has to share with us on purity being the moral compass. Sister Denise, very, very warm welcome. And as always, it's a pleasure to have you here with us Thank in the you, studio. Angela. Thank you. So um, the word um, moral compass is usually used when one is waving a finger at the other in judgment. And the word purity is practically unheard of. <laughs> um, it doesn't even mm. fall under old world values. So would you please tell us why um, this has such an important place in your own spiritual practice? There are five uh, elemental qualities of the soul and purity is the first one but the least tangible. Um, the others are peace, you know what peace feels like, love, it's a different feeling. Inner power, that's another feeling. Deep happiness or bliss, that's another feeling. But purity is a state of being absolutely real, absolutely clean. Perhaps the analogy is the flawless diamond. So a diamond, you can absolutely see all the way through it. There is nothing obstructing it. So purity is the... Um, the word to use that when you're making a moral decision it's not um, contaminated by any ulterior motive or um, uh, bent in another direction by fear or desire or being under an influence it's clean and straight mm. How would you define purity on a very practical level? How have you made purity part of your life? What, what is it? Is it cleanliness or what? It's many things. Cleanliness is a very big part of it. Um, it's how you look through your eyes. It's the discrimination, the choice where your eyes fall, what you listen to, how you interpret things. You know, there's many very subtle aspects of purity. Do you keep your mind clean? Do you keep your body clean? Keep your intentions clean? So it has a lot, lot to do with cleanliness. Um, your intentions, uh, that you are what you say you are. Uh, your inside and your outside is the same. It's a kind of transparency. You're not hiding anything. You're not trying to seem to be something, but in reality you're something else. Um, it's to do with clarity also. Mm. Um, these type of things. Um, 
why has it that the world has lost their moral compass or rather actually not lost it uh, they've, um, they've no I if you look at a compass that's not working it's dial it's turning around all the time and people don't know actually which way to go what what has caused uh, humanity to lose that intrinsic sense of this is right this is wrong where where did it all go askew I think one of the characteristics is this concern for looking good it's like almost an epidemic that people really are not worried about the integrity of their being or their actions but they want to be seen to be something and so they will do anything to create an appearance and they're not much concerned about what's behind that appearance so on one hand they're operating just as a veneer you see of um, being good but then behind that, I think people feel it doesn't matter, it's nobody's business, who cares, you know, what difference does it make? Uh, but they want to look good by the criteria of the people they seek to impress, and that is all to do with materialism. So, for example, if you want to be the president of a country, you have to be good-looking, you have to have charisma, uh, you have to have a nice wife and nice children, nice house, nice characteristics. So you will perform all of that, but it may be just a facade, it may be not real. And you talk sometimes about the dark side of people, and maybe the, the um, good-looking aspect is very thin, and the dark part is very deep so then the person is not very strong in that case and the less strong you are the less um, integrated you are with all the different parts of yourself the more you will strive to look good mm. and I think that the moral compass that I'm talking about as purity is where you really want to be um, absolutely in line with yourself you want to be true to yourself you want to be what you really are and so the concern is what am i and then if somebody likes it or doesn't like it that's less of interest um, but you know one strives to uh, fulfill one's own criteria and maybe your um, the thing that you compare yourself against is not public opinion which is very volatile but you want to compare yourself against the the being of God the suggestions of God for how to be the best that you can be as a divine child of the divine supreme being um, that last line um, does feeling that way give one a sense of identity well, very much so, yes. Because in the world, you know, it's all about your profession, your mask, your wealth, your looks, your achievements, your status, your influence. All of these things which are really very ephemeral, very short-lived. Whereas the things that I'm talking about, they're really the eternal aspects of yourself that you really want to make sure that they are intact. And then from that place, that inner core, then you come into action uh, accordingly and according to the circumstances, the people that are around you, so you come into action in a suitable way, but always you're coming from the reality of yourself. Mm. Sister Denise, you know, I once heard it said that we are all damaged. The only question is to what degree. What happens if you, if a person wants to be moral and upright and be the best that he, she wants to be? And what if they want to relate to God? 
but um, just the word mother sends them in her hurling and hurtling in the opposite direction because a very traumatic experience with mother or perhaps the same with father because those are the titles of God that I hear you use most often. Yeah, that's so true. What what happens when um, an aversion to God uh, because of those titles? What does one do in situations like that? Well, there's another angle you can look at, and that is that I, the self, am a very old antique in the um, restoration shop. And because you started off mentioning that everyone is damaged, and they're damaged by all of these relationships which are dysfunctional. By, by life. By life. Yeah, okay, antique. Yeah. So we're antiques, we've been hit here and uh, <laughs> broken there and so on and so forth. And, you know, uh, one of the names of God is the creator. And of course, as an eternal soul, you're not going to be created, but perhaps you're going to be restored to your original condition. I think of it more like that. And so all the different ways in which we are damaged um, especially through relationships. You say, well, you have an aversion to God as mother because mother means something terrible, or you have an aversion to God as father, or all the various different things. There are even people who have an aversion to God as God because the word God means something terrible to them because of their experience with their particular religious um, encounters. But, um, you know, uh, uh, when a person comes into an encounter with that one, uh, you may be very distorted through the damage of life, but that one is undistorted, you see. Mm. So when I'm in relation with one who knows exactly how to relate to me, uh, it doesn't matter what I do or how I feel or how I react, that person or well, that being will remain true, will remain stable, will remain steady. And that, that um, connection causes the damage to get repaired. It's a very slow, gentle process, but it is how it works. Mm. As you speak, the um, image flashed to my mind of uh, Michelangelo and David. Mm. Mm. Must be. Because of this, <laughs> <laughs> the background. So, uh, having a compass uh, implies a journey being undertaken somewhere. Uh, where are souls going to that they need a compass in the first place? Two, two places. One is you're going back to your original condition. Which is? Which is pure, perfect, beautiful undamaged, um, how you were before anything ever happened, you know, you're in your pristine condition. So that's a journey in, a journey back. Um, but there's an also, also a journey forward. Uh, so there's an evolutionary process taking place where you are growing into the um, potential that you have. And you're filling yourself up so that you can actually become what you were intended to be. So that's the journey forward. You're also journeying back to what we in Brahma Kumaris call the home, you know, because every soul is a visitor to the earth. This is not our place of residence or our original place, but we are returning to the world of nirvana the world of silence, the world of peace, where all souls come from. So we are visitors to this earth, we are guests, we are stewards, we play our part here and when the performance is over, we return. So now there is a return journey um, and so like the migrating uh, birds, say in Canada, they gather together in vast, vast quantities and they practice to fly south where they will spend the winter. So in a way, souls are doing something rather like that and getting ready to return back to the world of souls from where we came. Mm. 
and uh, when you leave your body, uh, you want to leave in the remembrance of God, so you have practice to go to God. So there's also that. Okay. So is purity a destination for you? I would say that it is, yes, because the condition that we are in when we begin the spiritual work is definitely impure. Impure in two ways. One is the soul is contaminated by negativity, which is just a factor of life, you know. And the other is impure in the sense of degraded due to age, um, just deterioration that happens. So just as any physical car will deteriorate, so also the soul deteriorates over time. And so you want to come back to your original condition. So the period of time in which that happens is um, one in which instead of getting old and worn out and progressively impure, everything is reversed and you are going back to your origins. And we call this period of time the confluence age. And what does that mean? It's a it's confluence. An uh, a confluence also means where a river meets the ocean. Yeah, that's the context in which I know it. But you're talking about time. Well, it's also a context where the soul, the river, meets the ocean of God. And what happens in that encounter is that you um, are brought back to your original condition. When a soul meets God, are all souls destined to meet God? Definitely there has to be an encounter with God which leaves an indelible impression on the soul so that the soul is able to remember um, when the time comes to meet God again because it's something that happens from time to time. Mm. So Denise, as you speak about purity and moral compass, the, um, I hear the words, but the feeling that is emanating from you is um, not so much silence but stillness. There's a sense of stillness um, and it comes across as all all is right and you come across as somebody being in, in alignment. What What is that about? The stillness, the, the alignment? I think part of it is you feel you have arrived you know where you're going, you know what to do, you know how to do it, and then you just get on with it. Okay, but um, most people don't know how to spell stillness, and you, um, you've obviously arrived. Um, your journey there is through the practice of your purity and through meditation, or did you have to do something else to become... Um, this and um, I know you've said in a previous show to us that you're still a work in progress you haven't uh, reached your zenith as it were okay so is stillness part of what you've accumulated in order to get there is this your stillness is it God's stillness that you're emanating when you become absolutely still time stops And then it can oh. start again. I felt that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, and there's something about that. That, that. that is so beautiful. That is so, so beautiful. Proceed. <laughs> <laughs> well, like in music, mm. there, there are silences, oh, yes, yes. which are very much part of the beauty of the music. And then from that silence, you again come into sound. But it's very important for us to reach that stillness where everything stops so that it can start again in the most beautiful way. And that is something that we have to practice with the mind. Because when the mind is still, then everything else is still. But you can't force your mind to stop like this with with um, violence, you see, because violence is a violation of the spirit. So through positive thought... Violence is a violation of the spirit. That is, um, that is a fresh definition of violence. Write that down.
<laughs> yes. Um, when you use positive thought, when you think things that are really true and deep and that you have recognized to be that, this is what takes you to a place of stillness mentally. And then you can um, sort of open yourself up to receive the deeper meaning of what you've understood. And that also kind of changes you and makes you more pure, more harmonious, more stable, more steady. And eventually you can just stop completely, leave this world and return again in a perfected state. Um, you have arrived, those, I'm using your words. What is left in your journey? Because most people would be quite happy to, I don't know, like die after having <laughs> achieved this, because it's what, um, uh, what you're describing is what I think Maslow would have called self-actualization in his hierarchy of needs. Mm. Uh, have you self-actualized? Are you still reaching your zenith? Uh, what, what, what's in your future? Where, where do you have to go from here? I think we have to... Is, is there more purity? We, there's always more to learn. Oh, really? <laughs> there's more to learn. <laughs> yes. And um, the process of building oneself, or refining oneself, and so on, it's a never-ending process. So you just keep becoming better. And I think that what you want is to say, okay, God, um, if you want to do something through me, I'm available, do it, you know. So making oneself available is, is good and trying to keep oneself in a good condition to be usable, that is also a good thing. Okay. Okay, I think we've come to the end. Is there any last final words that you wish to share with our audience who are sitting on the edge of their seats? I think lapping this all up. Explore the idea of silence, the idea of stillness, practice it, even if you get only a few seconds, but they build up and um, enjoy savoring the stillness because you go into the fragrance of it, the sweetness of it, the depth of it, and it is extremely rewarding, enriching. Mm. Mm. Um, I can't help but notice that none of the experiences that you um, speak about involve the body. They're asensorial. I don't know if there's such a word. Well, there should be. Uh, is it ab above you experience without using your senses? Well, what the senses about? are for the everyday world. Mm -hmm. And the senses will enable you to experience not every aspect of the physical world, but only those within the everyday world. So we have our everyday world experience, but um, the spiritual uh, journey takes you beyond that. And so you come into the body, do whatever you need in the body, and then go beyond the body. Let's see. Now you switch. This way, that way. You switch. Okay, so Sister Denise, that was uh, breathtaking. Uh, thank you. And I hope you embarked on a spiritual journey today with Sister Denise. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, brothers and sisters. I hope that you are able to experience some part of what Sister Denise was sharing. Uh, today felt not so much like a talk, but more on a spiritual journey. Sister Denise has walked for 40 years along this path. She has stopped, turned around, held out her hand to all of you listening, and has invited you to join her on the spiritual journey because she has tasted something that very few human beings have tasted and experienced, and that is the heart and mind of God. And um, it's not ordinary, it's real, and it's uh, the deepest message for me is that it's something that all of you can experience as well. So I hope that you do, 
I hope that this is a start of many good things to come for you. Thank you for joining us today and we hope to meet you again soon. Take care and goodbye.